Hello, and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to David Kowalski, Principal Consultant at Orteca. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And today we are joined by David Kowalski, Principal Consultant at Orteca. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. David, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Likewise, you're a longtime data diversity friend and speaker at our conferences which we always appreciate. Always great to see you at the events and so excited that face-to-face events are up and running again where we do get to see each other. Um, So tell me, David, uh, so you're the principal consultant at Orteca. What is Orteca and what is it that you do? Well, Orteca is a, uh, we describe ourselves as a uh, specialist consulting company. We are, our main headquarters are in London, but we also have offices in Nashville and Princeton in the U.S. Um, And we're dedicated to helping companies enable and exploit their data. Uh, We're also known as, um, you know, widely recognized as leading experts in DCAM and CVMC. Um, I'll tell you in a second what those are for anybody who doesn't know the acronyms. But, um, you know, and the other thing that distinguishes Orteca is most of our senior staff have actually had hands on kinds of jobs. We've sat in the executive seats. We've won large portions of large organizations. We're not career consultants who approach things theoretically. We walk the walk and talk the talk and have the battle scars to prove it. Um, I'm a principal consultant there, um, which basically means I, um, you know, I'm the senior lead on most of the projects I'm involved with. Um, you know, so I will go in and talk to uh, data management executives at our clients and uh, just look uh, at ways that they can um, come up with better strategies, better policies on how to manage their data. Uh, I also act as a subject matter expert internally, uh, especially in DCAM and CDMC. And since that's now the second time I've used those words, I will say that for anyone who's unfamiliar, uh, those are both industry standard frameworks um, created by the Enterprise Data Management Council. Um, I've been a major contributor to them. Um, DCAM is the Data Management Capability Assessment Model which is a framework that is about um, really best practices in how to manage data. Uh, And then the CDMC or cloud data management capability uh, framework is a more recent extension to that, which builds on framework and uh, builds on the DCAM framework and then looks at the kinds of things that you need to do additionally to manage data effectively in the cloud. I like it. So... David, tell me, when you were very young, is this what you dreamed of being when you grew up? I'm going to be an, a data management consultant. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> um, what do you want to be? Um, I mean, in the interest of uh, embarrassing myself uh, or not embarrassing myself too much, I'll skip over the parts where at the age of 10, I really wanted to be uh, James Bond. And at the age of 16, when I wanted to be the next Keith Emerson. Um, But that the second one is a little closer to the truth. I actually spent uh, most of my uh, well, pretty much all of my academic career and uh, most of my early adulthood uh, studying classical music composition. 
Um, I always assumed I'd end up um, teaching music uh, at a some kind of prestigious institution and um, that I would, um, you know, basically make my life, you know, about teaching people about classical music. Uh, as it turns out, I got my doctorate uh, from Princeton in 1985. And in 1985, really, nobody wanted to talk to you unless you had an MBA. Uh, it was certainly next to impossible to find teaching positions in the arts. And um, so um, at that point, I had done a lot of work with computer analysis and computer modeling of music as part of my dissertation work at Princeton. And um, AT&T had just been broken up a few months before I uh, got out of Princeton. They were desperate for anybody who even knew how to turn on a computer. And um, I ended up hooking up with another Princeton grad who was doing a lot of consulting work there. And so for nine years, um, almost all my uh, time was spent uh, rewriting old systems for AT&T. That's a pretty dramatic change. It really is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, I have to tell you, uh, when I first uh, started to try to talk my way into computer uh, positions, when I realized that academic uh, career was really not in the cards short term, um, I liked the computer work. I figured, let's see how I can get my way into that. But this was also pre-dot-com. And people don't remember that. I mean, once dot-com hit in the early 90s, um, if anybody remembers the old IBM PCs, they had that big red switch to turn it on and off. And we used to say, if you knew what the big red switch did, you could get hired. Um, but five years before that, uh, a lot of the big companies, I mean, I'd go to places like IBM and they would tell me, um, you don't have a computer science degree, you can't possibly work here. Um, so um, I, when I hooked up with this other guy from Princeton, we started talking about things. And uh, I, I'll be honest, I literally did not know what a database was at that point. Um, but then when we started to talk about it, I realized, well, what's a database? One way to describe a database is a bunch of disparate data points upon which structure has been imposed. And what's a piece of music? It's a bunch of disparate data points upon which structure has been imposed. So I, I liked playing around with computers. Once I made that kind of connection, um, it seemed even more relevant. Um, it certainly paid a heck of a lot more uh, than I was going to make at an entry level teaching position. And um, so I figured I'd try it out for a few years. And then once I bought my first house, I couldn't afford to take a teaching position anymore. So the rest is history, as they say. I, you know, I don't think so. A lot of people understand how much math and science is involved in music and, uh, you know, and and that's I love how music brought you to technology. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's it's not just the math and science. I mean, it's the general thinking of structure. And um, one of the things that I like to think uh, has always been a little bit out of the box thinking about data for me is one of the things you deal a lot with in music, especially classical music is um, if, you know, if you know anything about fractals, patterns that repeat on larger and larger and larger scales or going in the other direction are embedded at finer and finer and finer levels. That's very much a characteristic of a lot of classical music, but it's also very much um, about uh, the way a lot of data structures work. I mean, the kinds of things that you would do to define an individual data element are in many respects expandable to look at a model of how you would build a, a table. And then from there, how you would build a database. And from there, how you would build a system of databases. And then you start coming out of the technical or, or architectural part of it. And it really begins to have parallels in how you build the business side of the data management structure. So I have always said that, um, you know, at some points in my life, I've been closer and more involved in music than others. But even when I've not been actively doing music, um, a lot of musical thinking always informs the way I think of uh, my work around data management. I love it. So you, you're at at and and then where do you go from there? Well, from there, um, you know, I start. I was in there under the um, aegis of a very small consulting firm, and because we were mm -hmm. so small, um, I had to wear a lot of hats. 
you know, so I was I was the programmer, I was the database administrator, I was the system architect. More significantly for my longer term career, I was um, also the person who could actually talk to the client. I was equally comfortable talking to people on the business side and the technology side, so I could bridge that gap. And that stood me in really good stead. I bounced around from uh, one part of AT to an AT&T to another for almost 10 years. Um, finally, didn't uh, didn't actually like where my consulting company was going at that point. So uh, left there, um, moved into a completely different line of business. I'm still doing um, you know system development work, but this time for Church and Dwight, who are better known as the parent company of um, Arm and Hammer. Uh, the baking soda people, although these days they sell, sell a lot more than baking soda. And, uh, you know, and there, um, you know, I kind of hit a glass ceiling there and ended up going over to Merrill Lynch. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry, before Merrill Lynch was Morgan Stanley. And, um, you know, I was there through a consulting company, but it was a consulting company that specialized in work with Morgan Stanley. Um, so I got very, very immersed, um, not only moving more and more on the business side, but specifically into financial services. And by the time um, I left there, I was kind of really very much branded as a financial services guy and also uh, still kind of primarily on the technical side. But from there, I moved over to Merrill Lynch, which was in the process of being gobbled up by Bank of America. And shortly after starting there, I completely abandoned the technical side of things and got involved with the enterprise level group that was writing the policies, writing the strategies, writing the standards for our first um, data management program. Fascinating. That's interesting. Definitely a lot of data in uh, financial institutions. <laughs> Absolutely. And not, and the thing is, it's not just one of the things um, that I always get reminded of when I go to a data diversity event and talk to people who are not in financial services is I sometimes forget just how heavily regulated it is, you know. So um, we have a different set of uh, challenges there. I mean, in a financial uh, environment, very often uh, you have very stringent regulations that you have to comply with. You have federal regulators that you have to keep happy. The good side of it is because there are huge fines involved in not complying with those things, you don't very often have to justify yourself to management. They know if we don't do such and such, we're going to be paying it's fines that in some cases are literally amount to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars um, a day or a week, depending on the degree of infraction. And um, so it becomes, you know, when you start getting out there, like I say, I spent time not so much in data management. When I was at Church and Dwight, we didn't have any of those kinds of regulations. So it became much more, the internal people skills became much more important. And it became much more a case of talking to people about why this is a good idea, you know, just from uh, in terms of benefits to our company. You couldn't use that stick of it's going to cost us a bundle and fines if we don't do it. So it's so then leading into con, your current consulting role, you know, um, what is it? How are you helping your clients with data? What's the thing that you're you're working on the most and, and that's the most critical for your clients? And we we our clients tend to come in uh, two very distinct tiers. We have mm -hmm. a lot of um, um, regional uh usually banks, regional banks who are starting to grow very rapidly and just all of a sudden realizing the way we have been doing things just doesn't scale. So yeah. in those cases, we very often go in and it's like, okay, let's think strategically about this. Do you have a data management strategy? No, what's that? We have gone in, we have actually written the drafts of data management strategy for them. Uh, in other cases, we've looked at the, what they have as the beginnings of them and helped them uh, shape it into something that will actually give them a solid strategic direction. Uh, beyond that, we, uh, we also build out policies with them. We build out operating models. We do, uh, write, sometimes actually get down to helping them write their initial standards. 
Mm-hmm. And um, those are all things, I, I mean, we do in a sense, even if they've got a chief data officer, uh, we essentially uh, act as a kind of chief data officer or a chief data officer advocate for what kinds of things need to be, um, you know, put into place around the company. We also, at uh, the other extreme, work with a lot of really large global uh, financial institutions. And um, probably indiscreet for me to name the names, but let's just say we've got a lot of clients that you've heard of. Um, you know, based all, you know, and because we're based both in the U.S. and London, um, you know, we have a lot of our clients are based in the EU. A lot of them are here. Um, and also, as it turns out, Australia is really kind of getting religion about data management. We're doing a lot of work in Australia right now. There's a lot of new regulations coming out there. And with those larger companies, very often what we will do is we would come in and I mentioned VCAM earlier as a framework. Mm-hmm. It's also uh, got a scoring mechanism involved with it. It's a very effective assessment model of what are you set up to do. We are frequently brought into these large organizations to do DCAM assessments of how established um, various parts of their data management activities are. Um, Very often we find gaps uh, in there, no matter how long they've been doing data management, it turns out it's like we never really thought about that aspect of data architecture. Oh, we never really thought about centralizing such and such a kind of activity. I mean, there's a thousand different things that could show up in an assessment like that. And so um, at that point, we then start working with them. And these are usually companies that have been doing data management at a large scale for years, if not decades. So they have established strategies and policies, but we will then go in and start doing deep dives with them and look at, okay, what needs to change? What is it that has been working and is no longer working? Uh, We had a client last year, we were doing a lot of work. They were really starting to make a, a strong move into the cloud. And that was creating a lot of problems for them. And um, so really, it's just kind of looking at that, like what are all the pieces you need to get in place um, in order to make everything function as a unified whole? And we go in there, we do use uh, these EVM council frameworks, uh, DCAM and CDMC as a starting point. But as I said, most of us um, in Orteca have also spent a whole lot of years actually running organizations. So we have a lot of industry experience, which is further augmented by the various clients we've had around the world. And uh, we just we can go in and talk to people about, you know, this isn't just a good idea. We can show you real world use cases, even even if they're anonymized, we can really show you. It's like these are the various companies that have had problems with this, you know, and we've worked with big banks that had this problem and we've worked with small consumer firms that had this uh, problem. And this is the way they dealt with it. And here's how that looks at those companies six months later, a year later, two years later. Um, So that gives us a, a, I like to think it gives us a lot of street cred in terms of what we bring. It's not, we're, we don't go in there just with an academic model of how things should look. It's really a whole lot of experience in terms of what we know does and doesn't work. That's fantastic. So with that experience, um, what is your definition of data? Oh, um, <laughs> you gave me a heads up. You were gonna ask me about this one and, um, you know, and. I, I don't know um, if I think the um, I could I could probably spend a good hour talking about a really brilliant and insightful <laughs> definition of it. But most fundamentally, it's like when I think of data, it's um, really just any kind of measurement or, or description of some kind of concept or some kind of action or some kind of thing in the real world. Um, and um, You know, I think it's distinct from information, you know, uh, in fact, a lot of what I do as a consultant is help people turn data into useful, actionable information. I mean, the data is just out there. 
Um, and at a fundamental level, it's very important to make sure that you understand it, that uh, there is agreement in terms of what a given term means across the organization. Um, there, and in terms of how you get to that, do you have a single source of it or is that same piece of data replicated in numerous places around the company? So there's a lot of things that go into just playing, making sure that the data, whatever it's describing, whatever it's measuring, just making sure that it's consistent and um, consistent in terms of its appearance and it's uh, what numbers and uh, text are, but also consistent in terms of what people understand it to be. And then, of course, the next step is started taking it up into like uh, coming up with the ways in which you can ensure everybody does have that uh, common understanding, not just at the individual data element level, but also in terms of what does it mean in any given context. And that's where you start to bridge the gap into the data becoming information and the information being actionable and uh, your organization's leadership actually being able to look at reports and things and analytics that come out of that data and information and actually trust that it's something that they can uh, make decisions based upon. Makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So, David, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Oh, I, I think it's definitely increasing, um, but I also think uh, the nature of those jobs is going to be changing uh, fairly dramatically, um, certainly on the technology side. I mean, and not may necessarily in the ways that people immediately think. I mean, yes, there's constantly new uh, programming languages come out. There's new kinds of paradigms for programming, but ultimately programming is programming. Um, I mean, yes, I mean, back in the days when I used to write in assembly language in Fortran, we had to specify a heck of a lot more detail than modern languages require. But ultimately, it boils down to being able to describe something in individual discrete uh, steps and then describe that in a way that works for whatever kind of technical platform you're working upon. The one thing, um, you know, so those jobs, um, I think, will change in details, but not necessarily uh, fundamentally. Uh, I think there are some major kinds of uh, shifts, though, on the technology side, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, you know, uh, We've been talking about those terms for uh, actually in some cases for decades, but it's now coming to a degree of fruition that most people uh, can't even imagine. Folks who aren't in this field have no idea how often they are um, interacting with some kind of AI. Um, everything from you know, um, you know, the fairly simple act of Amazon telling you um, that it's like, oh, folks who bought this also bought this. I mean, that's been around for ages since the earliest days of Amazon, you know, but then you've also got the more subtle things. I mean, uh, especially in the advertising world, Google is famous or perhaps infamous for the fact that um, they gather information about what you're doing all over the web and start to make predictions about what products are you going to buy? What kind of news stories do you want to read? Um, and, um, you know, they start to try to predict things based on your past behavior. There's an awful lot happening in that space um, now. I mean, very, very recently, I mean, literally within the last couple of months, there's at least in the broader uh, literature, you're starting to see a huge focus on um, intelligent chatbots, you know, and um, we've already uh, probably all have some experience of uh, the various kinds of voice systems that we interact with when we, when we call the airlines to uh, get help with our reservation or, you know, when we try to get directed to the right person at a bank or at a utility company. You know, those, some of those uh, have been around in very crude ways for ages where they just sort of is some poor voice recognition and then they just branch down a tree um, of possible paths you can take. But now we're seeing true artificial intelligence in there where they really parse and try to understand what you're saying and then 
uh, really don't know where they're going to next. It's all sort of determined dynamically. There's a lot of new kind of work being uh, done there. I think just as some of those chatbots are going to be taking away a certain kind of job, um, you know, building them is going to take a much greater uh, degree of education and a lot more new kinds of jobs. I think one of the things, uh, I mean, we're starting to talk about it in Orteca right now. Um, we're seeing these various kinds of um, AI agents out there that will write code for you, that will write um, articles for you, uh, that will post your LinkedIn posts for you. Um, and it creates not just jobs, I think, around how do you train those bots so they're not just spitting out a bunch of ignorant boilerplate text, but also that it really starts to, ideally, you would want to see those things have um, an understanding of data ethics, you know, of data privacy. Um, a lot of these things require a degree of processing power that almost demands they sit out in the cloud, but especially if you're in a highly secure um, industry like healthcare or finance. Um, these are companies that aren't going to feel too good in general about data going out into the cloud uh, without, you know, even with all the guarantees that the cloud gives you, you know, what do we know about, um, you know, some of these newer bots? Um, I was on a meeting just earlier this morning. One of my guys uh, is doing a study of this. He now has a list of 47 different intelligent uh, chat bots that will do everything from actually chat with you to write articles for you. And he's doing um, a deep dive on them from the standpoint of, how much can we trust these various players? So Amazing. I think there's a yeah. whole kind of series of jobs that are going to be growing in that domain. I mean, and how you, not just in how you program them, but how you govern them. And really, and data ethics, I think, becomes a big piece of that. You know, we, very often we govern things from the standpoint of what we can legally do. But what we can ethically do, there's some things that are legal, but you know, I like to say about ethics, it's, it's the sort of stuff, if your customer knew you were doing that, how happy would they be about that? Um, and it's still, I think there's a lot of spotlight being shined on that lately, um, but I also think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done, um, frankly, especially in the U.S., in integrating data ethics oversight into um, AI and ML in particular. Um, and I don't want this to become a seminar on ethics in AI and ML, but I mean, on the ML side in particular, as you start to build analytical models and you look at the data that you're using to train your models, I mean, that of and in itself brings up a whole uh, realm of things that you need to address in terms of understanding bias and what's the ethical use of what comes out of those things. Now, that much said, um, I mean, those are things that are somewhat on the technical side, somewhat on the governance side, but I don't want people to lose track of the fact that, um, you know, there's still a lot of real fundamental kind of things that we will always need people in there guiding us on. Um, you know, uh, we can automate a lot of things about data governance, but ultimately we have to describe what, how we want things govern. Uh, we can, um, you know, basic processes, we can define stuff as processes and then automate them. But if we've got garbage uh, processes defined, then all automation is going to do is give us a lot more garbage at a lot faster uh, rate. And so I think ha there's also going to continue to be a role for, um, especially at senior management levels, the people who truly understand uh, the ethical uh, uh, as well as the legal ram uh, ramifications of what we are doing in any of these fields, and then ensuring that uh, any kind of automation in addition to any kind of manual processes around those things are in line with whatever our uh, are, I mean, really, everybody is, should have a statement of data ethics. And so they know it's like, well, okay, we, we can get away with this, but do we want to get away with this? Is this who we are? Is this the face we want to present to the public? Is this what we want our customers to know us as? Ready to share your knowledge and network with your data peers? 
Join us in San Diego this June for the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference. Five days packed full of new perspectives, new colleagues, and new approaches are yours when you register at dgiq2023west.dataversity.net. Lock in early bird savings when you register by May 5th. We'll see you there. It's very, very uh, appropriate and, and right. I, we've seen a lot of companies who have, you know, stood up machine learning and, and stood it up on data that was not prepped and was not can, did not contain quality and it went horribly exactly. awry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. The, and uh, another thing I want to say about that, I mean, it's almost why I think things like psychology become, um, you know, as an undergraduate, I mm -hmm. primarily studied music. I also studied a lot of uh, English literature and psychology um, and physics for that matter, um, which are three other fields I also continue to dabble in. But I think the psychology part of it starts to become very important as well. Um, and uh, in fact, it's something that I would actually think anybody who's serious about data management in the future should have at least some kind of psychology involved because you never know how people are going to react. You need to understand that. But another piece of it, coming back to uh, the question of the, you know, how you're training your models is that um, there's always going to be bias. I mean, we talk about how do we mitigate for bias in uh, building out a machine, uh, analytics model. But um, the truth of the matter is, you can never get rid of it. All you can really do is train yourself on becoming hypersensitive to the assumptions that we make. Because really, when you get right down to it, that's all bias is. But be aware of where we're making assumptions and recognize them as assumptions rather than as just the way it is. You know, um, you know, if we had had machine language uh, uh, or machine learning, rather, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, it would be, you know, typical to train certain kinds of job growth um, algorithms on the assumption that uh, women are only going to do a certain kind of work and only if they have the appropriate male oversight. You know, nowadays, you know, uh, and rightly so, we, you know, we bristle at that. But that was like, that was just built into the fabric of how people thought. It wasn't even a bias. It's just the way things were. And I would posit that, you know, 50, 60 years on, it may not be that, but we have equivalent things that 50 years from now will be every bit as appalling when we look back on it. And the more that we can actually understand the human element of what goes into data management, um, the more we can actually start to uh, come up with solutions that are fair, equitable, ethical, and basically, you know, you know, we're the, we can actually make the machines behave better than we as people ever did. So for people just getting into data, and um, thinking about these roles um, that you've been talking about that are going to become more available uh, as time goes on, what advice would you give to those to those people? It, is it continue just to you know make sure you understand the human elements? Are there classes? Are there books? Or is it what uh, what additional advice would you give? Well, you know, I got to tell you, I I have a kind of unique um, well. I like to think it's not that unique, but um, um, when I read these articles and I see them everywhere from like local newspapers, you know, to the Wall Street Journal about like the things that basically say these are the degrees that will make you the most money. This, you know, if you want if you want a high paying job, this is what you should study in school. It's like, no, I I have always that to me makes sense if you're going to a trade school. If you're going to college, you don't go to college to learn a craft. You go to college to learn how to think. And to me, the, one of the best ways to learn to think is study something about which you're passionate. Um, I like to think I'm pretty good about what I do in data management. And I do, I, I'm doing it all having, you know, an undergraduate and three distinct graduate degrees in music. Um, and it was something that I have always been passionate about and still passionate about. 
And so I would spend hours and hours and hours digging down there, learning how things were, taking stuff apart at the smallest detail until it got to the point where I had that almost automatic recognition of things and see how they replicated on larger scales. So, I mean, you know, I don't know, I, you know, is advanced basket weaving great training for data management? It might be in somebody's case. Um, but I, really, I think that is the key. It's like go to, go to school to learn how to think. Um, and yes, there are certain kinds of things, especially if you don't uh, aspire to advanced graduate work. Yeah, there are some basic kind of skills you're going to need. Um, you know, you'll need uh, if you even if you're not a programmer, there's basic programming concepts you have to understand. You've got to know some basic uh, stuff about how data is structured. You have to understand concepts like data quality and data architecture. Not necessarily well enough to do them, but even if you're going into the business side of data management, you really need to be able to talk to those people. So you do need exposure to that, but I think fundamentally, study the things that will teach you to think. Um, and um, I think more to the point, build the muscle. Um, I mean, I, I, call, I always uh, thought that most schools should have a course called BS 101. Um, you know, you want to, you want that ability. Some people, I'm appalled at what I sometimes see fundamentally intelligent people accepting at face value. It's like, you really need to uh, start asking the questions at, you know, an automatic level. It's like, um, you know, to the point where it's so fast and automatic, you don't even realize you're asking the questions, but it's like, who is saying this? What's their vested interest? What um, are their sources? Uh, why are they saying it now in this particular form? All those kinds of contextual things, I mean, don't accept it as fact until you've really done the research. Ask the questions, push back. Um, if you're making assumptions, beware you're making assumptions. We're back to that again. Um, but as much as you can, don't make the assumptions. Do the research, find out what you can. Um, you know, uh, use things like AI and ML um, to do the heavy lifting, not lifting on things, but um, don't believe everything that you see. You know, I mean, it's become kind of um, a joke that it's like, well, it must be true. I saw it on the internet. Um, but don't forget, not that many years ago, people used to think that about TV. It's got to be true. They said it on the news, you know, and it's like even more so if they said it on CBS or NBC or one of the big networks. Um, now, you could trust it better back in the days of Walter Cronkite, but now I'm really dating myself. Um, so, um, you know, but the thing is, even then, you know, it was like we trusted Walter Cronkite back in the 60s. Um, and I will say I, I'm just barely old enough to old, uh, to remember that. But he was trusted because the thing mm -hmm. is, like, even if he was saying something that seemed incredible in the moment, we knew from his track record that, you know, there was a very high probability that he was giving you an objective uh, fact based report on something. You know, and I think as as a population overall, we have lost a lot of that ability. We are too far too likely to latch on to the opinions that are the same as ours and to automatically reject the things we don't want to hear. Um, and I know this, and this is obviously a conversation that goes way beyond data management, but to bring it back to that topic, I think these are the kinds of things you need to get trained in. Um, I think college is an uh, excellent uh, place to do that because not only is it a place of learning it, uh, through classroom activities, it's a place of learning. It's one of the reasons why I personally am very down on, um, you know, remote college attendance, you know, because to me, I, I think of all the arguments and the heated discussions and drinking coffee at three in the morning while trying to debate such and such a point with other graduate students. Um, you know, whether I agreed with them or I didn't, I mean, that kind of passionate level of inquiry was something that came out of it. And it's when you become highly immersed in, in that degree of inquiry, when you can be that critical, when you know the questions to ask. Um, 
I think those are all things that ultimately uh, train you to have not just an entry level position in data management, but I think those are the kinds of things that ultimately have you um, leading, um, you know, if it's in your career path or your desired career path, if you want to run a really big kind of company, you know, and manage data for some international firm. I mean, that's what gives you the kinds of skills you need to come up to that. Makes sense. And, uh, you know, I just kind of paraphrase and summarize that, you know, and I'm, I'm hearing this from a lot of data practitioners is be curious. Absolutely. Ask a lot of questions. And and then you're adding to that and saying, yeah, um, basically build context around the data that you're receiving. Yeah. You know? <laughs> data with context. Um, yeah. So important. And uh, that's really great advice. I know law schools, you know, have had courses in ethics. Of course, they've had to for so many generations now right but mm -hmm. but maybe we do need that additional we, we have a lot of it that topic on our conferences now talking about data ethics but that need, maybe needs to be more prominent in a lot more education resources yeah yeah I, I i completely agree you know i mean and specifically you know i mean just given the nature of the data diversity events i mean specifically data ethics you know, because I mean, yes, um, you know, almost any large firm has mandatory behavioral ethics. You know, you don't accept gifts over a certain value. In some companies and industries, you don't accept gifts of any value from a, a client or a potential client. You do the things that avoid even the appearance of conflict of interest. Um, but, um, you know, there are all those behavioral ethical things. Um, you know, um, and that's very often the kind of ethics that get taught in uh, law schools, mm -hmm. you know, but data ethics really boils down to it's like, what data am I collecting on you? Why, mm -hmm. How, what am I disclosing to you about how I'm using that? How am I using that? Mm -hmm. And not only just kind of like, what kind of reports am I running on your data? What kind of things am I trying to uh, infer from your data? But how am I acting on that? Am I selling that data to other companies or am I only using it for my internal use? What are the internal uses? Um, you know, and so I think there are, uh, so even narrowing it down specifically to data ethics, we very often deal with uh, large firms that have a code of ethics in place and they govern in compliance with that. Um, but you say, okay, well, what about data ethics? And they look at it it's like, well, what's that? You know, they haven't really thought. It's, I mean, in a modern society that is every bit as critical as behavioral ethics, so much so that some of the people I talk to, it's actually hard for them to think of them differently. It's like they, act, you know, well, I wouldn't do that because that violates this behavioral ethic. Yeah, but let's look at the ways we actually put uh, guardrails in place to prevent people who aren't thinking as carefully about it from accidentally stumbling into these kinds of things. Absolutely. And then, and the other thing that I heard you say is be passionate about what you're doing. And that's a common theme as well. So don't just do it for the sake of doing it, but be passionate about it. Love what you're doing. Exactly. Love your doing. Yeah. Yeah. So important. Um, yeah. Years ago, I did. Uh, um, I was on a uh, consulting job with uh, somebody from another firm who told me, um, I've forgotten exactly how she put it, but um, she, prior to becoming a consultant, she had worked in a company where she had a small team reporting to her. And she told me, I hated passionate people. All they did was argue. Um, <laughs> and I get it. You know, sure. but the thing is, is like, you know, it's it, as long as it's controlled and it's not arguing for the sake of arguing. Um, I, um, you know, I, I mentioned I was at Bank of America for several years. I had a boss there uh, for most of the time I was there who sure. um, we uh, a lot of what we did was write standards and policies and internal white papers. And we would review each other's work. Um, sure. and then like debate like every single thing in there that we disagreed with but we would never stop the discussion until the other person legitimately came around to the way of thinking and the thing is even though he was my boss 
you know, he never once said, shut up, this is the way it is. It's like it was either he was convinced of my point or I became convinced of his point. And it happened about 50-50, you know, and they were always really, really fruitful kinds of discussions that not only led us to produce higher quality work, but I think really gave us both broader understandings of the environment in which we worked. Well, that's the other piece of your advice. Keep learning, right? Keep thinking, learn how to think and keep thinking and, and yeah. Yeah. So, which you can't do that without debate exactly. <laughs> and learning from others. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and that loving to learn is, it, I think that's something that's critical because we are in um, a time when so much of our industry is changing. At, I mean, sometimes almost, I, I mean, it's, it doesn't happen every day, but it's not uncommon every year, a couple of years for something to happen that so drastically alters it. Who, I mean, what was Zoom in January of 2000 or 2020? Right. You know, it's like, yeah, people knew about it. It was just like, it was an alternative to Skype. I mean, when your friend moved, when your friends moved to London, it was how you called them because it was cheaper than using the phone. Um, mm -hmm. Who would have thought that it would become so part and partial to how we operate as a business? You know, and then uh, as data management people and data governance people, it's like, you know, uh, you know, how long did it take us then to start to realize it's like, oh, wait a minute, this is essentially data sharing. How do we control what gets said on a Zoom meeting? You know, how do we know if somebody is recording a transcript or recording the whole thing? You know, that's when we started to see the various kinds of warnings pop up, not just in Zoom, but in the other video conferencing tools. Right. You know, so, um, you know, there are these, you know, game changers that come about at an ever increasingly rapid rate. And those of us who aren't willing, um, you know, to learn about the paradigm shifts and to learn about, you don't have to learn about the new technologies to the level that you can program them, but you've got to be aware of what they offer and what the ramifications of using them. And so that lifelong passion for learning, I think, stands anybody in very good stead for a career in data management. Such great advice, David. Oh, I love it. So important, such important concepts. And, and I'm hearing that a lot from a lot of different people. So and it's which is which is really good. It's fun to see the patterns evolve from these interviews. <laughs> Cause I do love data as well. Um so if somebody were to want to reach out to you or uh, get involved with Orteca, how would they go about doing that? Um, the, um, well, I don't expect anybody to write it right down, and I don't have it printed out to show you, but david.kowalski um, at orteca.com will reach me. Uh, you can also find me um, at, on LinkedIn. Uh, there are a bunch of other David Kowalskis there, um, but I'm the one, I never remember the format of that personalized address they give you on LinkedIn, but it's whatever it is, linkedin.com slash in, I think. And then, but the last part of it is David L. Kowalski. Perfect. And we'll get that posted to our page as yeah. well. So make sure people can can reach you if they if they want to solicit your services. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'm always interested in talking to people about this, um, you know, whether it's somebody who wants to work with Orteca, work for Orteca, or, um, you know, just chat about new concepts. Um, you know, I, you know, A, because I love learning about it and B, B it is part of my job, but I just, I'm um, always interested to hear about emerging trends, um, you know, and not just trend, um, I, I'm interested in the technology trends, but, um, you know, I'm also very interested in what kind of business drivers are emerging. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of uh, businesses that are now being forced to uh, uh, align, even if it's not regulatory uh, pressures. I mean, there's a big conversation for data privacy. I mean, the U.S., I'm embarrassed to say, is woefully behind the curve in terms of having, um, you know, a good data protection act at the international level. And unfortunately, that means we're now getting into the situation where, you know, one by one, the states are writing their own 
And so far it's, well, this one's a little bit stricter than this. And this one, you know, lets you get away with such and such. And these two are almost the same except for this. But eventually if that continues, we will get to the point where this one says do X and this one says do Y and you can't do them both because they're mutually uh, contradictory. And at that point, it literally becomes impossible for certain companies to operate in different parts of uh, the United States. You know, and I know there have been efforts to come up with a national standard um, and still not going anywhere really substantive yet. But, um, you know, those are those are kinds of things. Um, I mean, to some respect, I always find like people who are tied directly into federal government or state governments for that matter, um, but especially at federal government levels. Um, you know, I'm always very interested to find out what kinds of things are happening there, because ultimately that impacts the businesses and the businesses, you know, are what is really driving how data gets managed in any particular firm and even across any particular industry. Absolutely. Very, very important. Uh, and, and I agree it, that <laughs> I, I hope it unifies a little bit here soon. <laughs> it would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate the time. Uh, it's really been an enjoyable conversation. And uh, and for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.